You'll probably know Petra for this, but just around the corner from that is this, and this, and this, and walk to the next mountain range along, climb up through a canyon, and you'll eventually reach this, which looks a bit like the first one, but it's actually bigger. It's just it's harder to get to and isn't set in a canyon, so perhaps it isn't quite so impressive. That's Petra. It's over 2000 years old. It was originally made by the Nabataeans, but since then has had to endure earthquakes and the Romans coming along and knocking down lots of stuff to make room for an amphitheatre, which looks decidedly amateur in comparison. Also, about 100 years ago, Bedouin tribes shot up the treasury in the hope that it contained, you guessed it, treasure. It did not. It turns out the true treasure is the treasury's facade, which has somehow remained in excellent condition, despite everything it's had to go through. I'm not going to spend this video talking about stuff that can be found about it online because that's a waste. This is my own experience of the place, which will hopefully prepare you should you want to visit. So where is Petra? It's easy to believe that it's in the middle of nowhere, hidden in the desert somewhere. That's what Indiana Jones wants you to believe. But it's actually right next door to the city of Wadi Musa. There are many things in this video which you might think would detract from Petra, but I can assure you that not the town, nor the thousands of tourists, nor the hundreds of gift shops littering the place can ruin Petra. As a tourist visiting Petra, I think you've got to accept some of these things as a fact of life. This was the view from our hotel. The ruins of Petra are amongst these mountains, in a clearing behind it, and in the mountains beyond that as well. Even though it's right next door to the city, once you're in Petra itself, you wouldn't know that. It still feels like an adventure. I'm always bad at visualising a place before I've been there, but I can assure you that Petra isn't a maze. You can see it all on a single path that goes from start to finish. Here is the big open walk down. Here is the canyon you walk along. Here is the treasury, which is what everybody goes to see. But go just around the corner and the canyon opens up to reveal dozens of huge buildings carved into the cliffs. There's a large open bit with more traditional looking ruins either side and a few restaurants at the end. Then beyond there is the walk up to the monastery, which is definitely worth doing. That's Petra in a nutshell. Now to go over it again, but in more detail. From our hotel, we walk down to the entrance of Petra. There's a road you can take down, but Google Maps said the road on the other side was a minute shorter, so we foolishly went down that one instead. This one appears new and is perhaps underused because it is amusingly steep. Oh dear! Petra's expensive. For entry, I think it's something like $90 a person, but my girlfriend was sensible and pre-booked and got two days entry for $55. Do that instead. Once you enter Petra, you start down a long, exposed desert path towards the rocky mountain bit. There's no cover along here and it can get very hot, though you can get a horse ride down. But maybe you shouldn't, for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit. You might want to take pictures of the ruins that you see along here, but save your batteries for what is yet to come. You finally reach the mountain and follow a windy path through a canyon as it gets increasingly tall and spectacular. I am not a fan of vertical filming, but even with my wide-angled lens, I soon had no other way to capture the sheer scale of this canyon. It puts Cheddar Gorge to shame. It goes on for longer than you'd expect, and it's more impressive than you might think as well. I believe this build-up is part of the reason why people hype up the treasury so much more than the other parts of Petra. As you pass through this bit, there are regular echoey sounds of horses running back and forth, which you'll have to get out of the way for. And then the famous treasury comes into sight. And it is spectacular. It's 40 metres tall, and there are bits that you can climb for a better view. Once you're up there, I think it makes you appreciate just how big it is even more, though I'm somewhat thankful to other tourists for helping show the scale in these clips. What's inside? Who knows? Probably not much, and certainly no holy grail, as Indiana Jones led me to believe as a child. You're not allowed in anymore, which is probably for the best. You're free to go inside a number of the tombs further into Petra, but aside from some nice rock colours, I didn't get excited about their interiors. Petra really is about the outside, though these places are a good chance to escape from the sun for a while. The treasury does have a basement of some sort, which can be seen through the grids here. I didn't even bother going up to it to look. The reactions of the people who did was enough to know that there wasn't much worth seeing down there. I think it's safe to say that the site of the treasury is the main appeal. There's a cafe right opposite it, but luckily, it's far enough away to be out of sight of the pictures you'll be taking of it. So what if you want a picture in front of the treasury with nobody else around? We found it was surprisingly easy. We got there for 6 in the morning and, by virtue of our speed walking past all the Asian tourists, we were the second group down there. But you needn't rush, we found that until about 8 in the morning it was still easy to get a picture alone there. 
People were respectful of others and would wait their turn to stand in front of it. Plus, people are happy to take pictures of you if you offer to take pictures of them. It also gets quiet after about 5 in the evening. But it is worth coming back several times throughout the day because it's forever changing in colour as the sun travels across the sky. In early afternoon, the sandy floor is lit up and it gives the entire canyon a warm, sunny glow to it. I don't think we got to see the treasury in the sun at all, but it doesn't matter. It looks great at all times of the day. Also, it takes longer than you'd expect for the sun to reach into the canyon. You're probably talking about 10 in the morning or later, so don't sit there waiting for it. You have time to see the rest of Petra first. Just around the corner from the treasury, it opens out into the main bit of Petra, where there are dozens of huge buildings carved into the cliff walls. They're all impressive, if not so perfectly preserved as the treasury is. You also see the rubbishy old amphitheatre and its shoddy edges. Seriously, the Romans need to up their game. You can then walk down this path in a straight line to the next mountain. Although all of Petra is great, this is the least great bit. There are more traditional looking ruins either side. It amazes me that you're free to climb all over them and to touch artwork that must be millennia old, if you really wanted to. There's not a lot of health and safety in Petra and apparently people do occasionally die by falling off stuff while taking selfies, so just be sensible. Along this stretch, you'll also get some great views looking back at the bits of Petra you've already seen. There's just one bit of Petra left, and that's the monastery. It's an hour climb from the foot of the mountain, through a canyon-like area. I certainly suggest that you do it. You have to make your way through a lot of gift shops along the way. It gets rather tiring to continually turn down the same trinkets and stuff. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all, but they obviously all want your business. Also, you'll have to dodge regular donkeys carrying rather voluptuous human specimens up and down the path. This path can be slippery, but not scarily so as long as you take care and aren't a donkey that happens to be carrying a person. Eventually, you'll come out at the monastery, which looks very much like the treasury, only it's bigger and sits atop a mountain rather than inside a canyon. I think it's equally impressive, and it's a lot less busy up here because of how far it is to reach, so you're in a much better position to get a picture in front of it alone. I can imagine that sunsets here would look great, though you'll have to wait until the very last moment to see it here since the place closes at around that time and the walk back down the valley would become extremely dark. It's worth walking a little bit further for this beautiful panoramic view. The end of Petra is just as impressive as the beginning, with a view across some beautiful mountains and a misty drop into the haze below. And that's Petra. It's worth talking about the animal welfare here. There's a sign at the start saying that if you see any abuse that you should notify them about it. Apparently, they have taken steps to improve conditions for the animals, and although there wasn't a standout case of mistreatment that I felt I could report, Let's just say the general standard is not up to UK standards just yet. The animals in Petra have a tough life. I saw donkeys with cuts, I saw horses foaming at the mouth. They clearly work long, hot days, carrying weights that would not be permitted in England. It was sad to see horses barely bigger than ponies being forced to gallop whilst pulling heavy loads. Or poor donkeys carrying fat tourists up mountains, whipped and beaten if they stumbled or faltered. It was sadder still to hear tourists joke about it. And of course, it was always the heaviest people who rode them. One of them claimed to be from the Rockies and was loudly bragging about how she was used to traversing much bigger and tougher mountains than these. Which begs the question, why did she need a donkey ride in the first place? I understand that these animals are here because of tourists. Who am I as a wealthy foreigner to come here and to deal out judgement on the people trying to make a living? The way I see it, the best way to make a difference is to not ride these animals. Which we didn't. And we were offered dozens of lifts during our visit. Also, I would recommend spending two days in Petra. Time-wise, I think it's possible to do it all in one, but I certainly appreciated half a night's rest as there's a lot of walking to do, a lot of it up mountains and across uneven terrain. You'll be hot and drenched in sweat the whole time, which is made slightly more bearable if you can break up the walks with short stops. What we did worked kind of well. The first day, we did the walk straight through Petra from one side to the monastery and then back again which took us about four hours. Obviously, we weren't beasting it, we were taking our time to stop and to look at everything along the way. To our surprise, when we arrived at about two in the afternoon, it seemed like most people were leaving at about that time. I don't know if there's a strict closing time, just make sure you're out before sunset, as the canyon near the entrance can get pretty dark. The second day, we got there at about six in the morning and spent until midday there. Having already done the monastery, we didn't even bother going beyond the open area. Instead, there are two routes up to the tops of the mountains that we did. The first is this one, where you walk up a very impressive carved out route around the back of Petra, up to the top, into a few dead ends before reaching a lookout high above the treasury. This one really is impressive, and quite terrifying. This person here was lying on a pillow that I think was half off the side. You wouldn't see me there. 
As you can see, one of the locals has set up his camp here and demands that people who enter buy something. Clearly, you have no choice but to enter if you want the famous view of the treasury. Jury's out on whether he should be allowed to monetize the view in this way, when elsewhere in Petra, locals have to make do with setting up shop alongside the routes. And the second trek we did was to the High Palace of Sacrifice. If anywhere in Jordan is to be impressive, it's got to be somewhere named like that, right? Wrong! It's just a stone altar where they used to sacrifice animals, making it the least interesting place in Petra. Nice views though, and it must have been a real pain to get the animals up there. The bottom bit of the climb looks like this, then you go up through a narrow canyon, which can at points look a bit scary as you approach it, but then it's actually fine. And then it flattens off and you simply head for the highest point, which ends with a bit of a scramble. By this point, our water was running low and we did feel we had seen Petra. I got a moment of sadness knowing that I'd probably never return, so I had to see the treasury for the last time. As I headed out through the canyon, I did look back a few times. And that's Petra, definitely worth doing. The magnets there are pretty cheap, being two Jordanian dollars for seven, which as long as you don't tell anyone how cheap they are should pass as a nice little gift for friends and the like. If you want those famous jars of sand, you can get them in Petra, but similar replicas can be had for a fraction of the price up by the coach station at the entrance, and in several of the shops along the main road leading away. As a child, I remember seeing this in Indiana Jones. I think that when you see it in a movie, you take it for granted. Of course it's going to be great if they can go anywhere in the world to get some footage. There are probably places like this all over the world. Maybe it was just a set. I even remember thinking that if they were allowed to blow it up at the end, then it couldn't have been anything too special. But it is. Petra is one of a kind. It may look impressive in this wide-angled 4K footage, but it's no substitute for being there in person. So many times I took out the camera and was disappointed that I wasn't capturing the true scale, the unique smells, or the panoramic nature that makes this place so spectacular.